Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. For instance, we have a bot, her name's Marge, and you actually, Marge is a more of a digital controller. You can ask her tons of questions about your business, and she responds in two to three seconds. Hello, everyone. I'm Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That clip was from Kurt Rathman, CPA and founder of Scale Factor in Austin, Texas. If you have any interest in technology, automation, or just doing things more efficiently and getting more actionable results, you're really going to love this episode. To summarize Kurt's background, he was the proverbial child entrepreneur selling keychains to other kids in fourth grade. He became an accountant and worked in both public and industry, and through that realized that there really was a tremendous business opportunity out there to provide more timely, actionable data to businesses about their financial performance. And that was the genesis of Scale Factor which is now a four-year-old accounting tech company in Austin, Texas, that just added their 40th team member. It really is an interesting story. Before we get started, I got so caught up in the interview itself that I forgot to touch on Kurt's volunteer efforts in the recording as well. Kurt's actually very involved with Big Brothers Big Sisters there in Central Texas, and so I wanted to make sure to mention that and highlight it. After all, it's not all about work. It's about life. If you find that this episode has been valuable to you, please make sure to subscribe to our show via iTunes or directly on the website at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. Once again, that's whereaccountantsgo.com. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Here's Kurt Rathman of Scale Factor in Austin. Hello, Kurt. Thank you so much for making the time for this. I know it's a busy time for you and everybody these days, so thank you very much. Absolutely, Mark. I'm excited to be here today. Wonderful. Well, for our audience, we have Kurt Rathman on the phone. Kurt is the founder and CEO for Scale Factor in Austin, Texas. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion because Kurt has made a few interesting moves in his career involving industry and public accounting and owning businesses as well. So really looking forward to this because his current company really seems to be on the cutting edge in several ways. And Kurt, I definitely want to get into a discussion of Scale Factor itself and your vision for the company and that sort of thing, but I always like to start at the beginning so our audience understands where you came from, so they know your backstory and and they understand, you know, sort of how your career progressed. What initially led you to accounting as a possible career in the first place? You know, that's it's a great question, you know, and something that as the business has progressed, you know, something that I've thought about more and more. And, you know, I think it's definitely one of those things where it's not, as you might think, it's not any one thing. It was kind of a series of experiences and kind of and points during my life leading up to the point where I finally made that decision that that really kind of shaped it. And, you know, even as starting as early as back as, you know, in fourth grade, somehow I acquired the ability to make these keychain lanyards and I made them at home and I went to school and I sold them in my elementary uh, homeroom class in fourth grade. And, you know, during that time, I basically got in a bunch of trouble at school, right? I mean, you're not supposed to sell anything at school, and especially not in fourth grade. And it was just a, it was one of those moments that, you know, you can ask the family or, you know, parents and whatnot, and even me looking back, it was kind of like, that was a point in time, you know, something I still vividly remember. But, you know, it didn't stop there. You know, I've always been an entrepreneurial minded person and kind of just really, haven't necessarily tried to be that way. It's just kind of really the way that I look at the world and I analyze the situation. I mean, still even today, you know, with my wife, we go out to a dinner and or somewhere and I'm kind of analyzing the business model, you know, and so I've always kind of done that. Really, the first, you know, point and kind of exposure to accounting really was in high school. So since we've got some time, I'll kind of take everybody through the story, but, you know, we've never, you know, the folks inside Scale Factor certainly have had this story, but but externally here, you know, really... I grew up in Houston, Texas, actually just north of Houston in the Woodlands, Texas. And this was during the time that there was a lot of new home construction. It was kind of 
before the 2008, 2009 crash, you know, so it was kind of early 2000s, right? So it's just a lot of kind of prosperous growth, especially in that region. And the community was great. There was, a, you know, really what started is I had a, I was part of a group of friends that they were, you know, were in, they were starting to play musical instruments and in bands and in kind of some things that way. And I created the lighting company. That was my way to kind of be able to participate in this scene of people. And so we threw these we helped churches, Fellowship of the Woodlands and in the Woodlands. We did a number of shows there, Exxon Mobil. I mean, we were, we were doing these like lighting shows for concerts. And the thing was is that there wasn't really a lot of business, as you can imagine, right? And the turning point of kind of, you know, this is just a lesson in any business, but the turning point here was I had a good friend and it, the family just moved to a home in the Woodlands, a brand new home, and, and they put in a pool. And with it, there was new landscaping. And his dad, you know, came to myself and him, and, and he ended up turning to being a business partner is where I'm going with this, but came to us with a, a magazine of a beautiful lit backyard at nighttime with all these, you know, landscape lights everywhere. And he was kind of like, hey, guys, can you do this? And, you know, we're over ambitious, you know, teenage people that are trying to really drive forward. And it's kind of like, absolutely, yes. You know, the answer is yes. And so we figured out how to put in this landscape lighting system, right? And we went to Home Depot, kind of a low voltage landscape lighting system. And we put it into their yard and instantly kind of they had a dinner party that night or kind of, you know, had the neighbors over to kind of show off the new construction, kind of thanks to the neighborhood for putting up with us during this time. And someone was like, this landscape lighting is amazing. Can you, you know, what, how do you guys do this? Could you use it for my house and so forth? And instantly the answer was, yeah, sure, we'll do it for your house, right? And so that's how we kind of were able to change it very early on, this idea of this business that was really towards stage and entertainment type lighting, kind of the intelligent lights that you see the concert kind of move around. We had a garage of these things. It wasn't really a business. It was more of a hobby. But this is all of a sudden could take that same passion for lighting and, and make it into a real company. And, and that's what happened. So I'm getting to the point is was we grew this business and going into, I was 18 years old. I was not really going to go to college. We had three different crews of people working for us. At one point, there were 17 different people doing something for the business that turned out to be it's called Distinctive Illumination. And that was really my first exposure to accounting and, and accounting systems. And the cool part that we did there is that we would go to a prospect's home. We'd get a lead. We'd go to the prospect's home and we'd time this with the sun. And we'd put on this massive production, basically, of taking the homeowner through kind of here's your life before landscape lighting, here's your life after, right? And we'd get all their hopes and dreams and what they wanted to imagine their backyard for. And we'd actually show them the demo of this. It was just like a three-hour event, Right. And we'd take you there before the sun had gone down and then we'd, you know, we were putting in this kind of demo kit system afterwards. And then we would bring out for this kind of dramatic reveal, right? We would send the homeowner in, they'd come out and, you know, in this dramatic reveal, we'd kind of do this here's before and here's after. And it was always breathtaking. I mean, we had people in tears. I mean, the reactions you would get from this moment were incredible. And it was our secret sauce, right? It was how we sold this. And so the next step from there is it was basically like we'd freeze frame the system, the lighting system that we had put in place, and we'd create the quote right there. And that was my first really exposure to accounting because what we had, and this is 2002 or remember, I guess four at the time, right? We had a Palm Pilot that was wirelessly connected to QuickBooks desktop, and somehow I figured out a way at that time to basically have a live inventory environment back at my garage, my parents' garage. And it would tell us if we had something in stock or out of stock. And it would tell us if the supplier had it in stock. And we could do this all from this van, this mobile van that we were driving around, right? And so we had this cellular link. And at the time, I mean, this is, it was a really kind of tinkered toys together system, but we made it work, right? And what it allowed us to do is we had this, this color printer in the van and we had to amp up the battery on the van so it could handle this like laser printer printing this beautiful, really quote out to the homeowner. And it was our ability to take the homeowner through this process of not only before and after and getting them so excited, but then to give them a quote that was the price to kind of meet their dream in that moment. And we could tell them an install date. We could tell them exactly what we had in stock, what we had to order. We could give them, we knew the price right there. And, and it was our ability to kind of put that together is what made me intimately figure out QuickBooks at 18 years old, trying to figure out how to make this work. And so it wasn't, you know, I kind of put that on hold as I went into college. I wasn't really planning on going to college, but I come from a college educated family and I'm a third generation Longhorn here in Austin. So I'm definitely, I went to UT 
uh, here in Austin. And it wasn't really a, an option in my house not to go to school. But I definitely had the inklings and the feelings. And, you know, some weeks you'd ask me and this is what I was going to do, right? And so I kind of tucked it away, really, the accounting side for a while. You know, really, you go through business school. I, I started to you know, went through a process of kind of what do I do with that business? What do I not? And, and I basically I had to, and this will be a theme that we, get, that we talk about, but I had to make sure that I enjoyed the time in my life that was college, right? And I went through a period where I was driving back to Houston from Austin on the weekends to service customers on the landscape lighting side. And we could go on to, but we had this, one of the stupidest things we did later on after we weren't actively doing it anymore is we sold this maintenance package. So it's basically a subscription fee it would be great if you're running, but as you're a college student, you don't want to go home and drive home and change light bulbs during the weekend. And, and that's basically what I did. So it kind of made me, it kind of made me really shy away from the entrepreneurship thing for a bit, right? And just kind of focus on what do I want to be when I grow up? What's my ethos in the world? How am I going to approach this whole thing, right? And, and it took me to the point where there's an integrated program at UT that you apply for about your third year in, or maybe a couple semesters before that, but you've basically got your sea legs and what college is at that point, right? And I went through and, you know, it was one of those days where I think I called somebody, I was like, hey, do you want to go play volleyball or do you want to, you know, you basically want to hang out, right? Kind of go and go play, you know, do something, right? And and I got this response of, no, we're applying to this program, you know? And so I'm like, okay, and, you know, talk to the next person, I'm applying to this program. I'm like, all right, what is this program? I got to really... Now, at first, I wasn't really taking it seriously. I was kind of figure out what this thing is, right? Figured out what it was. I applied to it. It was the MPA program at UT, and I got in. And that was, I wasn't really expecting that, or I guess I didn't really have any expectations, right? It was kind of this free-flowing, kind of just trying to figure it out, right? Of, of, I'd proven to myself I could do so much at that point. I, was, I had a hard time kind of after that figuring out what I was going to do next. And this was one of those moments. It was kind of a focusing moment in my career, I'd say. You know, I got into this program and it's like, oh, what's the time period? Am I going to do it? Am I not? You know, what's this going to mean? You know, it's kind of like your third year in college. You got to decide what future is like. It was, it was a very hard time, I think, for everybody to decide that they were going to do this program. But that is life. That is growing up and going to school, right? And, and so it was great school, rated very highly for a number of years. And it's just kind of like, I've got to do this. This is one of those moments in life you just got to walk through the door. And so... That's what I did, you know, and that's where you learn so much more about accounting and the theory behind it and all the elements you really get in kind of a master's study of anything, right? And, and you really go deep into that. And many folks, you know, this is now in the time frame of the market crash of really my generation, right? It is, this was, you know, my peers were graduating during 2008, 9, and 10. And so a little bit of this was... You know, we got job offers our third year in the school. You went in, you did an internship with a big four public accounting firm, and then you would get a job offer if you could hang, really, you know. And so I was part of this population of people at the very moment in time that we had it figured out, you know. And, and I, I saw my friends and peers that weren't inside of this program go through this kind of existential crisis in the time frame. People couldn't get jobs for two years, you know, or even a year, and they didn't know what they were going to do. And it just provided, you know, what accounting did for me was this, I was very settled in it. I was very much, this is what I'm going to do. You know, I had proven to myself earlier on in my life that, man, if I understand this accounting thing, I can understand anything that's happening in the entire company. It really doesn't matter what it is from there, right? I can, and we really put this to use here today at Scale Factor. At that point in time, I was thinking, you know, it was kind of my safe spot that I could pivot to anything I wanted to do after that if I understood the accounting thing. And so that's what I did. You know, I, I went to KPMG. I worked for KPMG. I did my internship in Dallas, Texas. And then we could go through the journey from there, but moved up to Denver after that with KPMG and, and had a wonderful career at KPMG. There's just an element of having a first job. And I think that folks that are kind of considering, do I do public accounting, do I not? There are so many things that you learn in a firm environment that just give you a polish, that give you a poise, that give you an ability to kind of interact with somebody that either has an ego or doesn't or an executive or whatever it is that are just really invaluable. I mean, we really look for people today at Scale Factor that have had some sort of polish process already, right? We can do that with folks here, absolutely. And we, as we grow larger, we'll, we're going to give that back to the world, right? We're going to be right out of school. You come here and it'll be a great place to really, really learn how to be a professional. But my experience is, is I had a wonderful time at KPMG. So that was, that's how I got to be an accountant. You know, I, sometimes looking back, I say it's by accident to some degree, meaning that 
I didn't necessarily ask for this to happen or have this clarity moment that this is what I was going to do. It's just kind of one of those moments that kind of life happens for you. And, and the dots and the experience is all kind of leading up to that kind of makes you okay with that decision. And, and that's kind of what I would kind of explain my story as. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like you really set out to be an entrepreneur in the beginning. And did you come from a family of entrepreneurs or was everyone else, you know, in sort of a, a standard job and you're making keychains in fourth grade? <laughs> you know, that's something I've looked back on a lot. So my immediate family, my mom and my dad are not what I would consider entrepreneurs. They're successful professionals. I would not consider them entrepreneurs, but my grandpa was an entrepreneur. And that's a whole nother story. We should probably do a whole nother podcast about that. But basically, he owned a pharmacy in a town in West Texas. And so my mom's family grew up. That's what you did. You worked at the store. You worked at the pharmacy, right? So it was very much in my life and in my family. My, I really get it from my grandpa. I mean, as I get older, it is even mannerisms, the way I look at life, it is absolutely from there. So I would answer that, yeah, I, I do come from an entrepreneurial family. And now, you know, my brother is another founder in a different company here in Austin. So we've got it in our blood, absolutely. Okay, okay. Because I, I can see making the jump to accounting, particularly at that age, because, you know, it's the, the whole language of business idea, and I can understand that. I was just curious where that initial influence came from. So tell us, I guess, from KPMG, you know, through the steps to starting Scale Factor. Yeah. You know, it's kind of the dot connecting moving forward, right? And, and, and it's, it's a rather simple one, I think, ultimately, of, of just preferences uh, when it comes down to it. But the story, in a sense, of over time is that I, you know, the reason I say the, the story, it's just in a sense, when you look back, it's like this all does make sense of the perspective we have today. And I think that's why Scale Factor is really special because we a lot of us come from this similar perspective. But, you know, so in public accounting, right? doing a lot. I was in the audit practice in public accounting. I was, I would describe myself as, you said it well, I'm the entrepreneur, right? So I'm the entrepreneur with kind of, the reason I love audit, and I would suggest anybody do it or think about it, is you kind of get keys to the kingdom. You really do, right? And if you know that, or you can figure that out early on, you just internally can learn so much because you really have an ability to look in any part of any business and try to understand it. And as a 23, 24 year old professional, there's a lot of stuff you don't understand. So there's a ton of challenges to be able to kind of figure it out. So I like that. Eventually I got to a point though where my interests in a business are more the forward looking side. You know, so I would start to ask questions in the kind of the forward looking ones. Like how is the, you know, this company, how's the product launch going? Or what's next quarter going to look like? Or how did that, how did hiring the new CFO go or whatever the question was, right? And, and, and really an audit, that's not what you're focused on. <laughs> you're focused on last year and you're focused on doing the task at hand and getting in and getting out and having a great client relationship during the process and really kind of being a, a trusted resource. That is your role, right? What I was looking more is kind of the advisory side and kind of the forward looking side. But at that point, you know, it was just, it was just, I used my unique vantage point to figure it out. And I got to a point where KPMG was special for me is what it taught me is that accounting world is very antiquated. And it taught me that, that the accounting world is very slow to adopt technology. If you look on the technology curve of just the world and the way it's moving, I mean, tech, accounting is one of these areas that is a last frontier. And it's because there's a regulatory kind of aspect to it. And then you've got a really a lot of risk adverse folks and there's risk everywhere and you're grading that. And it's just the industry, right? I mean, it's very much the perspective on the industry is laggard. And KPMG taught me that. You look at the way we audited, you look at the way companies ran, you look at the amount of paper that people use and used. I learned that there is something here that's got to change and this is just not going to, the world's going to take off without this industry, right? And that's kind of what it was. And so what I was doing in these learnings is I was questioning to get back to something more entrepreneurial. I really was. I was convincing myself like, okay, this, I would change this and I'm that. And, and, and my focus was forward. And it was just, it got to the point where my own interests were taking off where it's like, you know, now is a good time to leave public accounting and go do something that's a different challenge to me. And as life would have it, my now wife gave me one of the best gifts for a birthday that I had. And it was this restaurant tour where you went around in Denver, Colorado, and you ate at a couple of restaurants and you were with a couple, you know, you were with some folks throughout the day and you rode around in this van and you, you know, you kind of created some bond with some folks throughout the day. And, and, 
it was special because I met a gentleman during that process that actually turned out to be a big influence in my career. But I basically met somebody and he was like, hey, I've got this company. We're reinvigorating it from an investment side. It's been around for 30 years. That's a massive potential in the market. They've got a big problem on the accounting side. You seem like the guy to do it. Come work for me or come work for this business. Of course, I was like, eh, I don't know. You know, and I went through a process of my own, you know, conservative process, right? And eventually he convinced me to come and work at this business. And so I left KPMG and I went to work for this company that I would consider more of a startup minded company in Denver, Colorado. And so that would be my, you know, I like to interject some learning lessons I've had over time for folks. And I look back at some of the, the things that, you know, these massive questions in my life that kind of stopped me in my tracks and I spent a lot of energy on trying to answer. And one of those would be, do I go into public accounting or do I not? Or what's my life look like past that? And kind of all this whole career path question. And my answer would be that there's so many people that go there and do exactly what I did. Stay there for two to three to four years. You learn so much in that time frame. And then you can go do something else really cool, right? And in fact, their business model is built off of you doing that. In fact, that's what they want people to do, right? And, and I would just remind people that collect everything you can in that time, but don't, it's not a forever decision. And at this point, this is when I made my non-forever decision, right? And, and I went to it. I joined this business as a controller. I became the CFO over time and we were growing massively. We were breaking everything in this company and in a great way, in a growth way. And, I, and this is where I learned the contrast of public accounting, which is more academic based and it's more perfect world based, right? It's much bigger company. So what I have coined the phrase of in the trenches CFO, it's completely different. You don't have the resources that a bigger company has. You don't have the ability to solve the problems. You've got questions that go unanswered because you just don't even have the pathway, the vector to even figure it out, right? And in the trench, the CFO has responsibilities of just keeping the business alive, keeping employees paid, customers collecting money from customers, you're paying vendors. I'm keeping what I call this business on the rails. And that's why kind of in the trenches, right? It's the day-to-day combat of running a business. And it is completely different than a public accounting. And this contrast, as I entered this environment where I basically inherited an accounting team, I inherited the accounting processes, I inherited so many things that were not me or my decisions, I guess the way you would have done it if you built it from the ground up. But but that's not, you know, that was kind of, that was okay, right? I was going to work with it. But really what started the process here is that We were spending so much time on the actual accounting process within the company that as CFO, I didn't have any time left to do my job of CFO, which is strategically guide the business, right? Like figure out what the accounting side is telling me and then and go and help make other decisions in the company based off of this financial data, which is what a CFO does. It was taking so long on the accounting side and the accounting process to do that, that I was, I was sensing I was going to fail as CFO. And so I went on this, this almost you know, tear to figure this out. And that was a a game changing, you know, aspect as well. And what I discovered at this is 2012, 2013 timeframe, I discovered the cloud accounting world. And we'll talk a lot more about that here throughout. But but really, I discovered the ability of I've got this server online, always happy to talk to me, I can integrate other things with it for the first time, we were starting to see that back in 2012. You know, that was the day that everyone, you know, if you watch the news, everyone was going to say, hey, one day, everyone's going to have one of these things called a smartphone. Right. That was kind of the, the times at that point. Right. So I discovered this world that was super exciting and the market of kind of QuickBooks Online and Zero. And, you know, when a company started to outgrow that and I was this I was that business, I was outgrowing that. It's like, what do you do from here? Right. Where I can't, you know, I'm like starting to outgrow kind of QuickBooks Online or, or even that says, what do I do from here? How do I get this business what it needs? And the answer to that is that there's a massive void there, right? It's really the next step up is a mid-market ERP platform, something like NetSuite or Intact or Dynamics, something like that. And there's just a big question for somebody in my vantage point at CFO at that time. So I became obsessed with solving this problem is, is basically what happened. I started to see the market. I started, I knew zero at the time when there were seven people in their app store, you know, seven other applications that said they integrate with zero. And now you look at, it's probably over, I know it's definitely over 500. I mean, it's it's much more than that. Right. And so this was something that I started at every waking moment I had, I would go study this and I was blogging about it. And I was kind of, I started to discover this little movement of the cloud accounting movement, kind of some of the other accounting folks that have seen, man, this is, this thing's changing a bit, right? And there's a small group of people back then and so small today. I mean, we're really on the cusp of the change of the industry, I think. And 
it was to the point where my wife suggested, you know, hey, Kurt, I'm just noticing that everything you're doing is surrounding this. You know, on the weekends, this is what you care about. After work, this is what you care about. Have you ever kind of thought that you might consider if there's something else, you know, here? And, and it was really my wife that kind of made me realize a bit of, made my interests are waning again, right? Like, it's, it's kind of like I'm seeing something. I'm seeing an opportunity. What is this thing? And so that's how Skill Factor started, to be honest with you. It was, I became obsessed with the problem until the point that I really couldn't think about anything else. And, and, you know, there's, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about here, maybe this is connecting, but I was obsessed. I was completely obsessed with solving this. I, you know, I don't necessarily choose, I chose to start Scout Factor. It was, it was, it was more of the sense of, I got to go solve this problem. You know, I see an opportunity. I see a way to solve it. I see it. I'm saying things that, you know, only a couple other people are getting, but it was kind of risky, but I, but I saw I could do it. So, January of 2014, moved from Denver, Colorado, back to Austin, Texas, and started Scale Factor Bootstrap from my living room table, a 680 square foot apartment at the end of Rainy Street, and that's that's how the business started. Interesting. It sounds like your wife sort of said, "Hey, look, if you're going to spend so much time, you know, why not get paid for it and and do it during the regular workday?" <laughs> Instead of the that's it. You know, and the funny part is, looking back, is we've actually had a moment differently. That was me saying that to her, right? So it makes us a good match, a good kind of pair. But yeah, that's exactly what it was. There you go. There you go. That's funny. Well, let's talk about Skill Factor and and Zero actually, because so obviously we were put in touch by one of the managers at Zero, and that's intriguing to me because they're, you know, further developing the market I'm in, in San Antonio. We're hearing more and more about zero and, you know, San Antonio arguably maybe is a little slower to adopt, you know, some of those technologies. So tell me about Skill Factor. You know, what's your, what are your specialties and how are you guys utilizing zero? Yeah. So, you know, Skill Factor, we're in a unique environment. One of the things that we are really focused on is really speeding up the data flow in the entire accounting environment. We have a problem with this idea of bookkeeping and it just taking a long time. We've seen in our experience, and that's, so we're four years old today. We're a couple of weeks past our fourth birthday, and, and now we're more designing software much more than when, you know, we're a software business today. When we started, we were a tech-forward services business. But the biggest thing that we're solving for is we're, you can file a tax return based off financials that are stale, in a sense. You can feel, you know, the business owner, and there's most business owners actually feel like a great custodian of a business when they have financial statements, right? Something to show for all their hard earned or hard effort and you know, successes and failures of that. It's, it's a great kind of record of that. But in reality, what we learned throughout the process is in the small business world, this data flow has got to be super fast for this to be operational for the business owner. You've got to give them information fast so they can make a decision. They need it faster than a larger company would because it's just a, it's a, everything moves faster in a smaller business, right? But the reality is that they don't even have the resources to necessarily do that. You've got this idea of a bookkeeper who gives you financial statements. I mean, sometimes it's 30 to 45 days after the month end, that period end. And it's absolutely not the way to actually do it. When we, our technological optimist view of the world says this is not the way to do it. So one of the things that we do is we speed up this transaction flow. What Scale Factor is, is really an operational platform for the business operator. We are focused on doing a lot of the accounting through our software, but really our customer is the business operator. We want to make it so easy for them to pay a bill. We want to make it so easy for them to onboard a new employee. We want to make it so easy for them to get help to other things that they, you know, questions that they might have about running their business or just best practices or things that they do. And really where we're headed though is helping them understand what's coming ahead, right? And really the forward proactive nature of running a business. Things like, hey, you need to go and make sure you sell this much in revenue this week because you're about to miss payroll next week. We can curb that compelling event from happening just with interacting with our software and where we're headed. So that's really what Scale Factor is in a sense. We completely take over the accounting for small businesses and really provide a a back office automation platform for them to be able to operate and run their business in a better way. And by virtue of that, we not only do accounting, but we get into other areas of the back office in that journey. With Xero is we are... You know, we're big fans of Zero. We always have been. We're a gold partner with Zero. We have been with that company since they were 
much, much smaller and really kind of even starting the U.S. expansion. We visited their offices and, you know, and the various offices they have in Denver and Bay and, and so forth and, and really just seeing their professionals kind of go and do other things in the industry, right? And, and so just a very much I've seen the company grow and really where they're headed. And one of the biggest things is Zero is a very clean version of an accounting platform. And we love it for that. We're, Scale Factor is not trying to create an accounting platform. And in fact, we rely on Zero to do that well. We rely on Zero to be a really good GL back in for a business, right? That's we need them for that. That's not what Scale Factor is. We integrate with Zero and just accounting platforms in general because businesses run better on something that, you know, the capital that Zero has put behind creating what they have today is enormous, right? And for somebody to try to recreate that in a sense is just not really strategically the way that we're moving. So Zero is a great company. I love the forward-looking side of it. The competitors out there, I definitely think that, you know, in the accounting space, they're forward-thinking and, and they're definitely trend-setting. And we interact with their development side. We interact with the front-end application. We interact with the partnership side of Zero. I mean, we're, we do a lot with the company, and I think we have a great relationship and, and always look to even to forge it further. So, you know, it's an interesting time here. You know, they are definitely have increased in market share and, and the way people kind of think about accounting. And, they, and I think that they're, you know, they're moving the space. And so it's always good to, you know, have somebody like that that you respect as well. Okay. So you're doing outsourced accounting. Do I understand it right? You're developing software apps as well? Yeah, we do. We are replacing kind of the outsourced accountant, uh, utilizing software to complete that function. And we do it a lot faster and we use a lot of tech in the process. I mean, for instance, we have a bot. Her name is Marge. And you actually, Marge is a more of a digital controller. You can ask her tons of questions about your business and she responds in two to three seconds rather than, you know, traditional kind of outsourced accountant or, or a bookkeeper responding to those types of questions. So, you know, we're really focusing on just increasing speed in every single thing we do. And, and the reality is that humans can't do that. Software has to do that. And so that's what Scale Factor is. Ah, okay. That's too cool. That's too cool. I have to tell you, we did a episode on robotics here not too long ago. And it was one of our more popular ones here recently. So this one's going to be a big hit. And so how large is your team now? You just hit your fourth anniversary or where are you guys moving to? What's your vision for the company? Yeah. So, you know, we are, um, so we're a VC backed company, right? So we have, by virtue of doing that and going that way, we have an incredible focus on growth. And, you know, everything is really around growing market share and growing what we're doing. So today is a special day in the company. You know, I'll kind of tell the story of just the morning to kind of to share with where we are at in the cycle. But a great friend, and our employee number one, a guy named Derek, who I think everybody in the business enormously respects. He's our director of people and culture and really the heading of what's so special here inside the walls of Scale Factor. But we still ship all the laptops to my home where there's a receiving kind of place and we make sure that we send any like high-end electronics to basically somebody that's able to receive this and sign for it and so forth. And so... Uh, still today, you know, Derek calls me and says, Kurt, I need a laptop. And so Derek actually picked me up this morning because I, I only Uber around now uh, in Austin. Uh, we've got one car in the family, but I'm a full-time rideshare user. And so when I can get a ride from Derek, you know, I'll jump in with Derek. And so I got in, you know, and we're driving driving to the office this morning and we've got two laptops, right? And we've got one person starting today. And we're at the point where we're, you know, we're, we've got this whole onboarding process for the team members, and it's just a wonderful time for them to get to know the business, These, the first couple of days especially. And, you know, I said, hey, Derek, our 40th person is starting today. And we kind of paused for a second, right? Because it's like Derek was the guy that helped us move out of the living room, right? So we're at 40 people. We're right here on the east side of Austin, Texas. We're a couple blocks away from downtown. We just moved into the other half of our building. So we're in about 7,000 square feet. So we're just at this really exciting time where there's a ton of growth. We have so many different roles that we are really hiring for now and will be in the future, but really with it, we're going to double in headcount this year. And the following year, we'll likely get close to that again. So I mean, we're going to be going through this 80 to 100 person mark here before we know it. Definitely kind of, you know, the 80 person mark kind of by the end of the year, and then we'll see what 2019 takes us for. But you know, there, you can have an incredible career here from not only an accounting standpoint, but a product standpoint, a development standpoint, marketing, sales. I mean, there's, it's really cool to walk around the business today because at 40 people, you definitely have some infrastructure built. But we're not too calcified in anything that we do that we can't rip something out and plug something back in the very next day to try something else. So it's just a really fun time in the company. And, and we've, 
you know, we've seen a lot of movement from our folks internally. And now it's the time, you know, at four years, you know, it's like, we've got some folks that have been here for three years of that four years. And, and scale factor, that's a long time. You know, three years is a long time. You're, you're the old guy or gal, which is funny because it's really not a long time at all, you know. But um, that's kind of the, it's the excitement, the energy. We are going through just a whole new kind of growth phase and figuring out how to grow faster and be smarter about what we do and listen to our customer and make sure we're solving for what the customer wants, which is huge, but we're using data to do that. So it's just a great time, you know, especially for the accounting profession. I think that we have so many, we have nine CPAs internally. We are built off of the accountant. I mean, that is the core perspective that we have. And we have every big four public accounting represented and even the other firms past that. So we, just, we have this incredible perspective that we can bring together. And I think the exciting part is, is you just stand inside the walls here, you're going to learn something. You know, I, I always, my phrase really is that people go get an MBA or just come here at this time because you'll learn way more here in three months than you would ever learn getting an MBA at this point. That's kind of the speed and the pace that we're moving at. So yeah, I'm very proud of the team and, and where we've come, but we're, we're kind of feel like we're at base camp right, right now. We've got a, a big mountain in front of us and, and that's when we're, we're headed straight up with it, up it. Wow. That's exciting. I did a little, you know, pre-show research just to get an idea of, you know, what the organization did, but I had no idea how fast you guys were going. Congratulations. That is super exciting. Uber exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, on the flip side, I'm curious because you've had all this success. You know, now that you've been in business a few years, anything you would have done differently in the early days? Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, that's a, it's a great question. I want to answer your question. I just want to kind of explain our ethos about it because it's more even the change, the way that we look at learning from what we've done, right? We're big about recognizing failures. You know, what did we fail at and why didn't it work? And we've got a culture, you know, that you've got to be very intentional about, you know, elements of your culture. And we certainly are on scale factor and we can always get better at what we do. But one of the biggest things is we don't have any problem talking about our failures. And in fact, it can be uncomfortable at points, right? But then you kind of just get used to it, right? Where it's now it's normal. It's kind of like, hey, Adam, that thing that you did, or hey, whomever, right? And, and you could kind of just pull names, right? It's, it's, it's okay. It's okay to fail at something. And in fact, if we're not failing, we're not moving fast enough. So that's one of the biggest things that I would say that I've learned over the years is that I would have moved faster on things at points in time. You know, I think that any leader in any business or business unit or PL or any type of activity, right, has got to have the ability to pattern match. You've got to have this voice inside your head that says, hmm, I've seen this before. We've seen this before, right? And, and we start to remind the team, right? And you can, we can make any mistake. We always say we're not saving lives here, and that's kind of more of a public accounting kind of phrase, right? But we're not. Anything's fixable, but we got to know about it. We got to learn from it and, and we got to do that well. And so, you know, in the early days, we learn a lesson over and over again. And that's a mistake, right? I mean, there's a bunch of adages around that, but you got to change and you got to execute change and you got to realize that that's happening. So I've got a saying that the team knows, but the saying is, you know, when the pain exceeds the pain to change, you will change. And any good leader knows that. And their team, if there's a point where you need to have somebody fail, your job as a leader is increase that pain. Help them through that failure. Help them realize that they are failing and what that looks like. And what do you need to do to change that trajectory, right? What's our plan from here? And I think that I didn't do that enough early on. And I think any entrepreneur would say that, right? Anybody as their career is growing would say that. Maybe that's just kind of what experience brings you. But it's all specifically around those items. The other thing I would say is, you know, the early day mistake that's more tactical and, and tangible kind of an answer to that is that we are a business that thrives under one roof. We are not great at separating our team or having a distributed workforce or anything like that. You definitely are working wherever at Scale Factor. We're very, you know, you, you got Slack, you got a cell phone connection or whatnot, we're plugging in. But the reality is the action is happening back at what we call HQ, at the office, right? That's where the innovation happens. That's where the conversations happen and so forth. And so one of the things, the early day mistakes that we tried, and I think the companies just go through this, is like, do I separate my workforce, right? I'm growing because of, you know, the floor plan or because of my space or my lease or, you know, whatever it is, I need to kind of have this other office space. And so we tried that out 
And it was the biggest, one of the biggest fails, I'd say, that I've had in one of the decisions that I've made because I've got failures, right? It's like that was, you know, Kurt, that was not a good decision. That was not a great decision, right? And what it did is it siloed our business. And I think every company goes through that. But especially when you're young, especially, I mean, I'd say if you're 100 people or less, you got to be under one roof. You really got to do that. And I think that folks that, you know, have companies that are truly remote or distributed in a sense, that's a hard business, I'd say. And, and you just got to realize that you got to always be working on that. I mean, I know companies do it well, and, and I'll just say I'm just not good at it. I, I don't know how to lead a business well that has everybody remote on that front. So those would be my early day learnings. You know, keep the team together and then realize when you're failing and fail fast. And you as a leader need to help your team fail because when they fail, you need to help them back up. Right. And so helping them fail is part of it. And I didn't learn that fast enough for my own kind of looking back, you know, and now I have and I'm all the better for it. But that's how to answer that. Wow, that's a lot of good insight. Yeah, I think a lot of times we think we're doing the person a favor by trying to help them and make it less painful. And really, you're just <laughs> you're you're prolonging the situation that's not going to work in the first place. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. You know, there's a nugget there. There's a book that we subscribe to and love called Radical Candor. And I suggest everybody, you know, and if you're leading people at all, go read that book. And there's a ton of YouTube videos you can watch. But basically, it's under the premise that you just described, right? Our responsibility is what I call human managers, right? Anybody in the world, right, is to be honest with them. And part of that is you got to let them know directly when something's not working. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be, you know, there's a word for it, right? You don't have to be that guy or that gal about it. You don't have to do it in, in a way that's threatening or harmful. You can do it with love, right? You can actually let somebody know that what they're doing is not working, but you can do it in a loving way. And Radical Candor is all about that. So I, I would recommend everybody read that. It's taught us a lot in this business. There's a whole lot of things. You mentioned another podcast sometimes. There's a whole lot of things I like to go into more depth about, but I do want to be respectful of your time. And so I think we better get to the, the final questions. I end every podcast with the same three questions because I think it gives us some consistency and there's just some reflection involved. The first one's usually the easiest for my guest. What has been your proudest moment? Yeah. You know, and as we were talking kind of leading up to this, you know, I had to put some thought into that because there's been, there's been a lot of times that have made me proud in the company. You know, and I think as I was thinking about the answer, it all comes back down to people. You know, everybody has a different reason for why they get up in the morning. I've been able to, to figure out mine and I'm very grateful that I can figure out mine at this stage of my life right now. I, I completely understand what I'm meant to do. And part of that is to help people develop, to help people past those voices in their head that say they can't do it or there's no other way or we, you know, it's never been done this way before or I'm just, it's not possible or kind of all those things, right? And, and my proudest moment has always been taking somebody on this journey and then seeing them win at the end of it. I love the conquering of the quest. I love the idea that you stand again at base camp and you look up at this mountain and you doubt your ability to be able to climb that thing. And then you start moving, right? You just get going. You write something down. You start the process. You start the innovation process. And you really block out anybody that's going to tell you you can't do it, right? Because that's what kills companies. That's what kills creativity. You've got to have a creative zone where everybody's just positive and encouraging because that's actually, that's what innovation is. And so for me, the proudest moment is seeing my team succeed. There's a guy, I'll name him by names because he's just such a great job at it. But a guy named Adam inside Scale Factory has been with us for three years. He's literally gone through and been in so many different areas of the business that he's leading a whole arena of the next stage of, of what we do. And because of that, just seeing him develop is one of the proudest things I can have. You know, I mean, Adam has come such a long way and, and just makes you see how successful he's going to be in his career. And for me to be able to help him do that along the way, that's why I do this every day. So it all comes back to proud moments of seeing people succeed and having some impact on them being able to do that. Yeah, that is special. Sort of like seeing your kids grow up. <laughs> yeah, it is, you know, but it, it's just uh, what we do is hard, you know. Startups are hard, so it's a, it's a validation of what we're doing ultimately. Very important. Well, I know we talked a little bit about, you know, the importance of failing and failing fast, you know, so to speak. Tell us about a mistake that you made and what you learned from it. And frankly, the bigger the better. We like the, the huge, ugly mistakes. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that kind of answered that in a bit of the separating the team or failing fast. I can tell you about some advice I've, I've received kind of through that process. Okay. You know, as you're 
it's simple, right? You wake up in the morning, you got so much energy and you can only focus on certain things. And then you just use your energy up throughout the day. And I've learned and had to learn that you just got to spend your energy in the right way. You know, if it's failing, realize that, don't dwell on it, move forward, right? If it's winning, celebrate, absolutely celebrate every win, but move forward. Make sure that you're constantly aware where you're spending your energy as a leader. Because you only got so much for it, and you got to recharge, and you got to think time, and you got to do all that stuff, right? And, and so some of the best advice I've ever received on that side of it is, is just spending your energy in the right places. I think that as a business owner, any business owner, that's the constant challenge because you're really a core part of every process, and you just got to choose your battles. And I think that if you do that well, you'll succeed. Uh, but you got to have this kind of a true kind of emotional intelligence viewpoint of it, right? It's like, what did I just do, Kurt? How did I just spend the last hour? Is that really the best way? And you just got to always kind of have that questioning mindset of, of how you're spending your time. So that's what I would say to that. That makes a lot of sense. So you've been a wonderful guest, and I can see why you're so successful. You've been at least one step, if not many, ahead of me throughout this whole interview. And, and here I usually ask a question about the best piece of advice as the closing thought, and you just shared a great piece of advice for us. So I'll still give you the choice or the option, I guess, the opportunity, if you will. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received or is uh, what you just referred to the most appropriate? Yeah, you know, I'll give another tidbit that I think is very, that I remind myself all the time. It's just that as a people leader, you've got to show progress in what you're doing because growth really does equal progress. And if you're not progressing in something, that's when people get stale. That's when they question their, you know, everything they're doing, right? They question their career, their job, you know, their affinity to your company, everything, right? And so it goes in line, but you've got to make, you know, I'll tie it into the last side is spending energy. You've got to make sure that you're providing a pathway for people to grow. And that's the key to a successful manager and a successful company in my mind. And helping people through that process is how you get the best out of people. And and that's the reality of what we are, right? As any leader in a business, you should spend all your time making sure your people are amazing, right? Because that's how you move the business forward. Uh, You cannot do it without the people that you have. And so I spend a lot of time on that. And what I've learned is that you've got to have a pathway for people to grow. Uh, Without that, everything kind of breaks. So I would leave it at that, and I'll, I'll probably end it at that. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Seriously, Kurt, I had no idea when we scheduled this how fast y'all were going. And and so I really am honored that you took the time out to share your time with me and, and the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was great being here. Well, for our audience, this has been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. If you haven't yet visited our home website, please do so. That's www.whereaccountantsgo.com. Once again, it's whereaccountantsgo.com. On that note, Kurt, any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with? It would be just go for it. You know, everything's fixable. You're not saving lives. You know, take the chances. Accounting is the language of business in my mind. Master that and then figure out where you want to go from there. I think that's the best way really to proceed. But if you've got that voice inside your head that's telling you you can't do it or or you're not sure or whatnot, don't use your energy like that, right? Just do it. You'll be surprised with how the pathway ultimately allows your career to proceed. So that would be my last final thought for everybody. Well, thank you. That is very wise. Thank you again to the audience for joining us. We will see you all next week. There's more to come.